backgrounds. Um, we are um, very pleased to have um, Dr. Robert Eckel uh, talk to us on diabetes and COVID-19 evolving paradigm of observational data. Uh, Dr. Eckel is Professor of Medicine Emeritus, Division of Endocrinology, Metabolism, and Diabetes at University of Colorado in Denver. He um, is also the Chair in Atherosclerosis in the Department of Medicine at University of Colorado. Uh, he's a distinguished alum alumnus uh, from a place close to us, uh, University of Cincinnati, uh, College of Medicine in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, he did his residency training at the uh, University of Wisconsin and fellowship in metabolism and uh, endocrinology at uh, University of uh, Washington in Seattle. Um, he has had a distinguished career over the last uh, 40 years or so, uh, has published uh, well over 300 articles. Uh, he has the distinction of being the president of three different societies, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, including the American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association, the Obesity Society, and also uh, the Association of Patient-Oriented Research. Um, we are all familiar with the cholesterol guidelines, and he was part of that uh, uh, guideline committee, and also co-chaired the uh, ACC AHA lifestyle guidelines for prevention of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Um, he is um, a member of the EDIC uh, Observational Safety Monitoring Board, uh, he has had um, num numerous distinction and uh, presented uh, widely. He has also been the Edwin Bierman Lecturership of the ADA and the Banting Award uh, Lecturer. Um, so he has numerous trainees uh, who have uh, gone on to do wonderful things, including Dr. Phil Kern down the road in Lexington. So welcome, Dr. Uh, Echo. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Rhea. It's really great to be part of this uh, Endocrine Grand Rounds uh, seminar series at the University of Louisville. It's uh, another river town. I miss uh, Cincinnati in many, many ways, but living in Colorado is a hard place to leave. So anyway, I'm going to leave that all behind and start uh, presenting my topic today. The title is An Evolving Paradigm of Observational Data, and that's meant it's tongue-in-cheek in a way in that randomized controlled trials is something we're really used to in science and medicine, but that's not been the case for how COVID-19 has impacted diabetes and diabetes impacted COVID-19. So for this particular talk, I have no duality of interest. So let's look at the objectives today. The first are, are patients with diabetes at increased risk for COVID-19 infection? The second bullet point are patients with diabetes with COVID-19 infection at increased risk for hospitalization intensive care unit admit, uh, admission and also assisted ventilation and all cause or related mortality to their diabetes. What is the impact of hyperglycemia on outcomes? And then the other issue, man management considerations for patients with diabetes and COVID-19 infection. That, that relates to prevention and outpatient management, and that could be at discharge from the hospital. And ultimately, drug management and hospitalized patients with diabetes and COVID-19 infection, and there's specifically glycemic management beyond insulin, and the use of RAS inhibitors, glucocorticoids, and statins, and of course, there are a multiplicity of other drugs that have been utilized in diabetes, and we'll touch base with that just very briefly in a comment to follow. So the first bullet point is, are patients with diabetes at increased risk of COVID-19 infection? And as immediate past president, I was president at the time of the American Diabetes Association. In June of 2020, we put forth this statement. There are not enough data to show whether people with diabetes are more likely to get COVID-19 than the general population. And the problem people with diabetes face is primarily a problem of worse outcomes, not greater chance of contracting the virus. Now, that was highly uh, based on speculation at that time. But now a non-systematic review, and you can conclude from that however you want, a series of articles published in the English language and reported outcomes on the prevalence and the effect of diabetes on outcomes and patients' characteristics. I'm quoting from this article recently published just a week ago. The prevalence of diabetes in COVID-19 patients appears like that in the general population. And while, without going and drilling down on that data, my surveillance, surveillance of the literature really documents that at this time, 
we don't have convincing evidence that patients with type 2 or type 1 diabetes have a greater likelihood of getting the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus or having COVID-19 infection. Now, the, the association between COVID-19 and type 1 diabetes, here's a systematic review that basically ultimately boiled the numerous studies down into 15 studies that met, met the criteria for a qualitative analysis of the relationship of type 1 to diabetes. And in that study, the prevalence of type 1 diabetes in patients with COVID-19 ranged from 0.15 to nearly 30%. What can we make of that? And again, these are 15 studies the limited number of studies that dealt with type 1 diabetes alone. And then more recent data from children and youth with diabetes, there was evidence that there was not an increased risk for hospitalization due to COVID-19. And then finally, from January to October of 2020, the prevalence of these antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2 virus were not different in children and adults with and without type 1 diabetes in Colorado. That study was carried out at the Barbara Davis Center, which is a building right next to mine. That's a group of people I've interacted with on multiple occasions over my decades at that university. They found no evidence for increased prevalence of COVID-19 infections among youth with newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes. So here's more focus on type 1. But the evidence for type 2 clearly does not demonstrate an increased risk of infection. So let's just move on then to the second bullet point. Are patients with diabetes with COVID-19 infection at increased risk for hospitalization, intensive care unit admission with assisted ventilation, and mortality? Now, I've given this talk now probably um, a number of times over the last eight or nine months or so. And here are data that I really gathered up to a certain interval that really looked at a series of different studies. And by the way, there are probably now up to 100 reports of observational data that relate to outcomes of people with diabetes. And I'm just going to conclude from these series of uh, peer-reviewed manuscripts that overall patients with diabetes hospitalized with COVID-19 are two to three times more likely than the prevalence of diabetes in these societies to, to be hospitalized, and two to three times more likely to have critical illness or die from their COVID-19 infection. Now, mechanisms associated with increased COVID-19 severity in individuals with diabetes can be to some extent based on the science of what we know of patients living with diabetes. And these were summarized by Sue Lim, a colleague of mine in South Korea, who ultimately published these data just very recently. So here's the virus entering in. The question comes up about the ability of the patient with diabetes to develop a natural killer cell response and a pro-inflammatory cytokine response. And by the way, data outside of the field of diabetes has indicated that this cytokine storm, if you will, is less severe in patients with COVID-19 infection with or without diabetes than it is in other septic conditions, such as influenza A. So anyway, the increase of presentation of reactive oxygen species and uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, activation of the RAS angiotensin system, and the prothrombotic risk all downstream of things that relate to diabetes, includes, including the setting of insulin resistance, of course, the reduced insulin secretion in uh, type 2, and also, also raising the possibility of hyperglycemia, by the way, which could occur in patients without diabetes, and ultimately, the prothrombotic relationship that exists I think all add up to the fact that many people with diabetes have pre-existing conditions where the impact of the virus on multiple pathways may lead to an adverse outcome, including hospitalization into the intensive care unit and mortality to follow. Now, ultimately, a, a paper that relates diabetes to itself in terms of etiologies for outcomes is really uh, mirrored by the fact that it's all related to the comorbidities. So let's just look at this. So this is one comorbidity, obesity, and survival in COVID-19 infected patients. This study was from Bologna, Italy. And what we're seeing is the impact of people with BMIs above 30 to those below 30. And we know most of our diabetes patients, uh, in fact, I would say over 80% of our type 2s are at least overweight or obese. Obesity itself has an independent effect on outcome. 
And then there's this recent paper from the Journal of the American Heart Association that looked at coronavirus disease in terms of the 2019 hospitalizations attributable to cardiometabolic conditions. And ultimately, this study would show as of November 18th from 2020, this observation nested nearly a million adult COVID-19 hospitalizations in the US and 70,000 were in COVID-19 net states. So this is around the United States. And so here's the overlap, if you will, of cardiometabolic conditions that relate to diabetes. Here's diabetes, 14.2%. 14 14 here's hypertension, uh, about as prevalent, but here, in terms of the overall prevalence, 30%, but in terms of prevalence in terms of people with hypertension alone versus diabetes as a whole about the similar prevalence, but then obesity, much more common. And here's that you know Venn diagram that shows overlapping between these various cardiometabolic conditions in terms of the distributions of patients in the NHANES database between 2015 and 2018, and only 40% with no underlying condition. And here are the outcomes. This is the proportion of hospitalizations among US adults attributable to diabetes. So as you can see, there's an age dependency, there's a racial and, and ethnic distribution, and also a somewhat of a gender distribution, but not so prevalent as it is for various races, races and ethnicity over a range of ages. Now, when we look at cardiometabolic conditions, the four that I just mentioned, ultimately now we're seeing that a high percentage of patients, up to 30 to 40% of people are impacted in terms of these various age ranges, sex distribution, and race and ethnicity to more favorable, uh, less favorable outcomes in terms of being hospitalized with COVID-19 infection. So again, the take home point is it's just not diabetes alone it probably relates to the interaction of diabetes with many other comorbid conditions. Let's turn now to the impact of hyperglycemia on outcomes related to COVID-19 infection. So th this was the initial study carried out by Bruce Bodie from Atlanta, where in fact, what he did is looked at the impact of glycemia on outcomes in patients with COVID-19 infection. These data were gathered between March the 1st and April the 6th. Some 1,100 patients were identified in 88 US hospitals. Here's the group that had diabetes and or uncontrolled hyperglycemia, some 451. And here's the group without diabetes or uncontrolled hyperglycemia, about 60% uh, of that group if you break down the numbers. So here are the patients, their gender distribution, median age in the 60s, BMIs as expected in the low 30s, A1Cs 8.7 versus 5.8. You can say, well, 5.8, maybe a subset of this group had prediabetes. And diabetes by A1C criteria were there in 194 of the 451. Look at this. Only about a, a quarter to a third had a known diagnosis of diabetes based on A1C criteria. And ultimately, those without were obviously defined upfront as having no history of an A1C elevation. Here we're looking at the impact of diabetes, including hyperglycemia in the absence of known diabetes on outcomes with patients with COVID-19 infection. So here's the group with diabetes or uncontrolled hyperglycemia. We're looking at all cause mortality. And here's the group without. A some fourfold increase in all cause mortality that relates to the group on the left. But here's what's something I found incredibly interesting that has been paralleled by a series of studies looking at a similar impact of hyperglycemia compared to diabetes on outcomes. So here are people whose A1Cs were greater than 6.5 on admission and we're looking at outcomes related to uh, ultimately, here I think we're looking at all-cause mortality again, and here we're looking at uncontrolled hyperglycemia without known diabetes. So what we're saying here is having no knowledge of having diabetes and having uncontrolled hyperglycemia resulted in a worse outcome than patients who had had known diabetes who were diagnosed uh, in, in the hospital with having an A1C greater than 6.5%. Relatively small study, but it was the first to identify that hyperglycemia independent of known diabetes could impact the outcome from COVID-19 infection.
Then there are other databases, and I'm not going to share all of them, just selected ones based on the presence or absence of hyperglycemia. This is a study out of Naples, Italy, had a much larger cohort for observation. Here's the outcome looking at survival of patients ultimately with no hyperglycemia and diabetes versus those with hyperglycemia with or without diabetes. And we see the staggered case. The green bar is no hyperglycemia with diabetes. And again, the Italian experience, at least from the group in Naples, showed that hyperglycemia with no diabetes was associated with ultimately the worst outcome. So all this aside, I think we're seeing from several databases that this hyperglycemic environment in the hospitalized patients may be important. Now here's an ability to translate observational data that may be something that relates to the standard of care for hospitalized patients with any infection that's systemic and potentially lethal going forward. These are the outcomes in patients with COVID-19 from Hawaii, China. And here are patients with diabetes who are well controlled during the hospitalization. And that takes place within the first 24 hours of hospitalization versus those that are less well entitled here, poorly controlled. So the diagram nicely shows the almost complete survival of patients with diabetes who are well controlled. Sample size is shown down here, 250 matched up front. And here's a greater than a 10% likelihood of mortality in patients with poorly controlled diabetes. And those are defined by th these criteria, upper limit of less than 10 millimolar, which is about 180 milligrams per deciliter. And these people had an, average, or had an upper limit of glucose during the hospitalization of greater than 180 milligrams per deciliter. And as we think about taking care of hospitalized patients with diabetes, anyway, in any type of, of rationale for being hospitalized, you know, that, that's kind of standard of care of maintaining them somewhere between 110 and 180 to avoid hypoglycemia and more severe hyperglycemia, I think is really, uh, you know, ultimately recapitulated in these, this observational study carried out in Hubei, China. Now, when we're looking at survival curves, more Chinese data, Wuhan, uh, remember that that's where this virus originated. And now we're looking at data stratified by fasting blood glucose and a score that relates to severity of the outcome. And here we're looking at gradations of glycemia, less than 6.1, that's less than 100, 6.1 to 6.9, up to perhaps uh, levels in the low 120s and greater than seven millimolar. And here's the gradient outcomes. So this is cumulative mortality using the strata over this CRB score, which was an assessment of severity of infection. And here we're looking at those who in fact were in the most hyperglycemic range during their hospitalization using the strata of zero point CRB score up to 3.4. These outcomes are much less favorable in the setting of continued hyperglycemia during the hospitalization. Now, ultimately, if we look at uh, the impact of hyperglycemia on admission of COVID-19 mortality and complications, more data from Wuhan. And I think what we can ultimately see here is looking at patients without previous diabetes uh, from two different hospital systems or those with a fasting glucose less than 100 or a glucose uh, above 7 millimolar. That's going to be about 115, 120. And ultimately, the outcomes, hazard ratio, for 28-day mortality and those patients who had, who had no, nine, not, no known diabetes before the hospitalization. And ultimately, we're looking at those with known diabetes or a fasting plasma glucose of seven millimolar or greater. The mortality is clearly greater at 28 days. And those with complications about twice as likely with a higher level of glycemic excursion within the hospitalization. So I think overall, we are looking again at diabetes plus hyperglycemia. Now here's another study that looks at outcomes of patients with COVID-19 with diabetes who are either intubated or die from uh, their infection. And in this study, it, it's not glucose, and it, it's glucose, not the A1C. And this is a study from France, incorporating data from 53 centers across France in March of 2020. So here's individuals with an A1C of 6% versus those compared to an A1C of 7.8%, fairly flat over A1C gradations. 
And over, oh, here's admission plasma glucose shown here. But when we look at people whose A1Cs are 6%, odds ratio of poor outcomes uh, versus those with A1Cs of 7.8%, we're seeing that those who maintain higher glucoses during hospitalization that have higher glucoses during hospitalization, this group and this group aren't all that different compared to the group whose A1Cs were 6% over, over uh, the range of, of, of outcomes that relates to outcomes that are unfavorable in patients with hyperglycemia and A1Cs than ultimately those who in fact had lower levels of plasma glucose in the setting of the two different levels of A1C. So is another concept that comes up with diabetes is, is COVID-19 uh, a new type of diabetes? And ultimately in, uh, in late summer of this last year, led by Francesco Rubino from the King's College in London, and uh, Stephanie Emil from uh, Sang Institution, and then Paul Zimmet from Monash University, Monash University in Melbourne, they raised the question, is, is COVID-19 a new type of diabetes? And this was based on a series of cases that arose where in patients who were hyperglycemic, whose A1Cs were not elevated, had what perhaps could be a disease that could relate to the SARS-CoV-2 virus specifically. And at this point in time, a global registry has now been initiated. And uh, I should point out that I was privileged to be one of 16 authors uh, internationally who were involved in this letter to the New England Journal. And now we're up to over 300 patients being identified with new onset diabetes from 68 countries from around the world that are ultimately gonna be uh, gaining momentum together a greater case report so that the data became, became, can become clear as to whether a new type of diabetes relates to COVID-2 and ultimately entrance of, of the virus, perhaps into the beta cell to modify insulin secretion. So here's the updated data, and I had this updated even earlier today, so forgive me, but we're now talking about, uh, well, I mentioned 68 countries, but now 165 since February 16th have gone up to 306 subjects now that have been identified ultimately from a, a number of countries. I don't recall the exact number beyond 20, but here's a, a series of, of studies over time that are gonna be possible getting this registry provided to see in fact, whether this is a unique type of diabetes. Patients who are perhaps leaner on presentation are antibody, autoantibody negative, who then have new onset diabetes in the presence of an A1C less than 6.5% on admission. So this is gonna take time for this database to accumulate and to get sufficient patient records made available to allow that data to be informative about whether the COVID-2 uh, virus could actually modify the natural history or new onset diabetes in the setting of the infection. Now, some recent reports have demonstrated the effect of glucose variability, so-called time and range, which we're all used to, and adverse outcomes. More data here from a series of Shanghai hospitals and here's a time and range from 70 to 160%, showing ultimately the time and range above 70%, which is a threshold that I think we all kind of aim for in our patients on CGM. Ultimately, with levels in range below that, the outcome becomes much more favorable. And this is the CV, a glucose variability here being lower versus those with higher. Uh, and ultimately, I think this again points to the idea of maintaining a level of glycemic control in hospitalized patients who have diabetes or present with hyperglycemia. Here, the range was 70 to 160. Again, I think most guidelines and those put forth by the Professional Practice Committee of the American Diabetes Association would suggest a range of 110 to 180 in hospitalized patients, not being more aggressive to avoid hyperglycemia. Now, let me turn uh, right now briefly to what about COVID-19 infection and outcomes in people with type 1 diabetes. Of all the databases out there, ultimately most of the studies have not tried to distinguish type 1 from type 2 diabetes. And so this began kind of, of uh, increasing additional interest by a report by Justin Gregory from the Vanderbilt C Clinic Community Experience where they conducted a prospective cohort study to identify case subjects with COVID-19 across a regional healthcare network 
of 137 service locations using an electronic medical record. And they identified COVID-19 in 6,000 patients, 40 and 273 without diabetes and with type 1 and type 2 respectively. So these are the ones without diabetes, 40 with type 1 and 273 with type 2, a fairly small study. But I think it opened up the door to something that we really didn't know much about until this paper of recent. So here's the no diabetes cohort, those with type 1, type 2, the distributions of age, sex, BMI, BMI, as you notice, quite different, 32.6 versus 25, weights different. Most recent hemoglobin A1C, a little bit higher here than it was here. Most recent A1C within the past year, uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the within range, uh, we're seeing it here. And diagnosis of hypertension, much, much smaller, uh, of course, in numbers, but in terms of the numbers of patients, 40 versus 273, certainly the numbers look uh, a bit greater in terms of the percent in patients with type 1 than type 2. Actually, I'm sorry, 71 versus 270, higher in type 2 than in type 1. So here were the factors that Justin Gregory identified that related to more severe illness in 37 of these 40 patients who had type 1 infection. The data were not replete in those other three subjects to come up with anything that was conclusive. Higher A1C in the past year, hypertension history, DKA in the past year, absence of continuous glucose monitoring, people who use multiple daily injections were at higher risk for poor outcomes than people that used insulin infusion pumps. The black race did less favorable, as it's true in type 2 diabetes. And people who had public or no health insurance at all did less well than people who had third-party payment systems to reimburse the cost of their hospitalization. And what I want to point out here by this fairly complicated diagram is that here's the relationship between age and outcome and patients with type 1, and here it is with type 2. And ultimately, we're seeing ultimately uh, a relationship that relates to the type of diabetes and outcome. And by, by far, the two most important predictive factors about outcome was age and diabetes, whether type 1 or type 2. And you see the gradient of a series of risk factors on the left, with age still being very, very important, of course, black race, et cetera, that relate to the outcomes here and outcomes here. So this is hospitalization and probability thereof that relate to these variety of comorbidities and related risk factors in type 1 versus type 2. You know, another cohort, a larger cohort, was carried out uh, based on the type 1 diabetes exchange. This is a multi-center surveillance study of 113 patients with type 1. They identified, again, A1C as a predictor of, uh, of, of hospitalization for, for diabetes with age, gender, race, cardiovascular disease prevalence, and chronic kidney disease all having some association but less so, I think, than the A1C in terms of the fully adjusted statistics. Here, the variance is quite high. So these stats here clearly show a risk of race and cardiovascular disease. But the unadjusted was really not modified by, much by the adjustment for all these other risk factors. So diabetes or A1C before hospitalization seemed to be a predictor. Now, I think one of the most informative databases that looks at outcome is the UK Biobank, which looked at 61 million people in the United Kingdom. Of course, they have a standardized healthcare system that allows data drilling to be much more capable than it is in the US. So of those people within uh, the United Kingdom, there were 263,000 individuals plus who had type 1 diabetes, 2.8 million with type 2 diabetes, and ultimately 23,800 COVID-19 deaths, 7466 with type 2, and 365 with type 1. And here's the age dependency of this very negative outcome. Now, I guess you could say, what is the explanation for this increased risk of outcome in patients with type 1? I think the, the data don't really clearly speak to this, but perhaps more DKA in this population, perhaps uh, less likely to seek attention. I think duration of disease that relates to age in a type 1, which we know is often diagnosed in this age range, not here, probably all of these things have influenced the outcome to some extent. And you know, age itself modifies our immunologic surveillance system, and perhaps more so in diabetes than patients without diabetes. 
So all these factors, I think, need to be taken into consideration when we think about this increased risk for poor outcomes, here specifically mortality, in patients with an age dependency of type 1 versus type 2. Now, what Justin Gregory's done subsequent to that is take three databases, ultimately the one in England I just mentioned to you, a recent database from Scotland, and that from the Vanderbilt Healthcare System, and looking at the odds ratios of type 1 versus no diabetes, and that's for adverse outcomes, which would be intensive care unit admission or death from COVID-19 infection, and adjusted odds ratios for type 2 diabetes versus no diabetes. And you can see 3.5 versus 2.0 looks quite a bit different, doesn't it? 2.4 versus 1.4 and 4.6, little less difference in terms of ultimately uh, the, the, um, the, the final database based on the Vanderbilt healthcare system. But ultimately, when you compare all of these analyses, you come up with the idea that type 1 probably is not protective. And that's led to a, uh, an article or a, actually a correspondence that uh, Al Powers and I sent to the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology to think that COVID-19 vaccine should be prioritized just not for people with type 2 diabetes as a potential comorbidity for bad outcomes for people with type 1 diabetes. And this led to a letter from Bob Gabay and a number of other authors from the American Diabetes Association to the CDC and to all the governors around the state with the advocacy effort at the ADA following up on these recommendations that patients with type 1 are equally as likely, if not more likely, to have adverse outcomes than type 2. And patients with type 1 diabetes need to be prioritized for vaccination to prevent and hopefully prevent infection to begin with, but certainly make adverse outcomes less likely to ensue. Now, when we look at the, the Scottish data, which I think just were published, I think Justin had access to these data before then, basically this was the total Scottish population in March 1 of 2020, some 5 million plus individuals with diabetes, uh, a certain percentage, 5.8%. 0.3% of whom developed fatal or critical care unit treated COVID-19 infection by July the 31st, of whom 90% were aged 60 years or greater. And in, in the population without diabetes, 0.1% of people developed fatal or critical care illness related outcomes. So th these are the database, this is the database from Helen Calhoun and her cohort in Scotland, and ultimately shows the impact of, of men versus women with and without diabetes, again, with the age dependency of this adverse effect. And here you're seeing a, a early COVID-19 age, meaning people with diabetes and COVID-19 infection affect performing like an older age of people without the infection. And these data just came out just a few days ago, and I actually added this to the database near the end of its uh, finalization for presentation to you today. So odds ratios, uh, 2.4 for type 1, 1.4 for type 2, and that p-value is strongly significant for both compared to an age and sex match control group without diabetes. Again, greater odds ratio for type 1 than type 2. Let's now turn to some more practical issues that relate to management considerations for patients with diabetes and COVID-19 infection. I'd first like to turn to prevention and outpatient management. Ultimately, this paper in Diabetologia late last year really recognizes that um, we need to take steps to modify risk in patients with diabetes. Although we right now don't have sufficient data to indicate patients with diabetes are increased risk, but we could theorize because of immunologic surveillance and the ability to, to amount to an innate and adaptive immune response could be uh, modified adversely in patients with diabetes. I just don't think the data show this yet in terms of increased risk of infection, but the recommendations would be to continue regular glucose lowering therapy, monitor glucoses and ketones regularly, clearly uh, take all the common sense relationships that have been uh, put forth in terms of prevention of SARS-CoV-2 infection, and also continue the ACEs and ARBs. And I'll return to that in a second. So ultimately then, you know, the whole issue of management, asymptomatic people, patients with symptoms that aren't severe or less severe illness, obviously that's gonna to lead 
to hospitalization, hospitalization uh, perhaps to follow. But then preventive and management considerations for people with diabetes, again, to be summarized, relate to glycemic control and maintaining as much as possible a healthy lifestyle. And of course, vaccines, pneumococcal and seasonal influenza should be mandated for people living with diabetes. But now, again, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, prioritization for COVID-19 vaccination. Now, there's some additional thoughts in the elderly, and I'm not gonna stepwise go through people who are elderly in this age range. We could debate that age to some extent, but it's the whole issue of accessibility to healthcare and uh, taking certain steps to stratify, uh, uh, you know, address challenges that relate to accessibility to healthcare. It's a problem in many parts around the United States. We all know that well. Uh, the multi-complexity and geriatric syndromes that relate to the care of the elderly and how people with diabetes who are in the older age range may in fact be more likely to falls and polypharmacy and medication interference and of hypoglycemia, et cetera. The burden of diabetes self-care, many people in this age range may need help from a family member, a neighbor, or even a visiting nurse service. Psychological stress is something that many people have stressed. That's not a space that I've been in particularly scientifically, but nevertheless, we certainly know the stress that goes on for all of us in the setting of COVID-19, potential COVID-19 infection. And ultimately, medication and equipment access, making sure prescriptions are refilled, that visits by telemedicine, if not personally, are carried out in a routine manner. So this is uh, nicely assessed by these authors in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine back in July of last year. Now, ultimately, I was a part of a, a series of co-authors, again, globally, Stefan Bornstein, the lead author on this, that looked at steps that related to outpatient care. And many of these are kind of summarized on the slides I presented previously. And inpatient care is something that we're going to, to bring more attention to in a moment. But we encourage healthcare providers and patients who had access to some information related to this, that they need to bring their medications to the hospital with them. So many times people don't know what they're taking and ultimately when they're hospitalized for COVID-19, in addition for other reasons to be hospitalized, the electronic medical record at their hospital uh, of admission, it may not be where their medical records are back home. Insulin infusion pumps and CGMs, bring them with them. And the ADA has been very proactive in making sure that CGM can be continued and patient managed in the hospital unless the patient is admitted to the intensive care unit. But now let's turn to drug management and hospitalized patients with diabetes or hyperglycemia and COVID-19 infection. So I'm gonna talk about two components here, glycemic management beyond insulin and RAS inhibitors, corticosteroids, and statins. And then I'm gonna to return to insulin in the end in terms of some recommendations about insulin management. Now, clearly, uh, you know, there some, was some question early on about whether metformin should be continued in hospitalized patients. And I'm gonna to return to that in a second. But I see no reason for people who are hospitalized to be uh, um, on a sodium glucose transport inhibitors. However, that whole paradigm may be changing now. And I've seen some preliminary data in the presence or absence of diabetes that may uh, be looking favorable in terms of the impact of one of these drugs, dapagliflozin, on outcomes that relate to hospitalized patients with COVID-19, again, with and without diabetes. But if we look at predictors of hospital discharge and mortality in patients with diabetes, 19, uh, of diabetes and COVID-19 infection, these are updated data from the Coronata study now, the Coronado Initiative was a French nationwide multi-center studies of patients with diabetes hospitalized for COVID-19 with a 28-day follow-up patient. I presented a little bit of this data earlier. The patients were screened after hospital admission from March the 10th to April the 10th, where hospital discharge and death were assessed within 28 days. And included were about 3,000 participants, two-thirds men, mean age around 70, and BMI 28. And here is the ability of metformin in this database to favorably affect discharge from the hospital and reduce death. Now, it's a single study, even though a large cohort study, in terms of looking at data relates to multiple components of patient characteristics that predict discharge from the hospital or death sufficient to make one say 
that metformin should be added to patients not on metformin when they're hospitalized. Absolutely not. But I think that makes us think that maybe people on metformin, returning to two slides ago, maybe we should continue metformin and not be so concerned about things that relate to renal function, lactic acidosis. Of course, all these things should be taken into consideration and someone who may be more likely to develop dehydration, renal dysfunction that's severe, et cetera. So we need to be a good physician under these circumstances and not jump to conclusions that metformin should be instituted. Now, the whole ACE2 a, uh, ARB study, ARB uh, blockers, the RAS system inhibitors, ultimately came under criticism initially because if the ACE2 protein is the mechanism by which this virus gains entry into multiple tissues around the body, blocking this system may increase the likelihood of ACE2 expression and therefore allow greater viral entry. So I'm going to summarize a fairly large literature, this from the Hubei province in China, that looked at non-ACE ARB treated patients versus those treated with patients. And we now have additional studies that have exemplified the benefit of these agents not being discontinued. Now, this study showed a benefit of being on these agents, but I think the data overall reflect that RAS inhibitors overall should not be discontinued based on no proven evidence of harm. Again, observational data, no good randomized controlled trials about taking people off versus taking people on. Generally, people on these agents do equally as well, if not better, in terms of poor outcomes than patients who, in fact, are not on these agents. Now, when we think about steroids, that's a more complicated question. So there's fairly good data, and these are a composite of a series of, of trials done, at, done related to steroid administration. We're talking about high-dose dexamethasone, basically. The recovery trial being the strongest of these, that's shown about a 30% a benefit of being treated with high-dose dexamethasone in terms of the impact on all-cause mortality in people with COVID-19 infection or who have required assisted ventilation or oxygen therapy. So this is the WHO rapid evidence appraisal for steroid therapy in terms of patients hospitalized with COVID-19, a 30% benefit. But what about patients with diabetes? And we all certainly know that patients with diabetes given six, 16 milligrams of dexamethasone a day, or even, even a quarter of that, develop marked hyperglycemia. So we just don't know, in terms of patients with diabetes, whether this is a favorable effect, an unfavorable effect, or has no influence on outcomes. So recommendations, we all have algorithms in our hospitalized patients for management of long-acting insulins and also uh, about short-acting insulins in terms of titration of dose based on the degree of glycemic excursion during the hospitalization. This is just an example of formulas that I'm sure you have at the University of Louisville hospitals that relate to management of diabetes in hospitalized patients. So the only reason I'm showing you this is we must take steps to evaluate hyperglycemia and control it more favorably in our hospitalized patients, but particularly in those that are given high-dose steroids that were uncertain, favorably impact outcomes in patients with diabetes. And if I go back to this database, ultimately you can't really dissect these data in a way of determining how many had diabetes and how many different. They just don't show that kind of data, all these studies. So too bad, but yet we're just gonna have to wait maybe for something more randomized trial related in patients with diabetes. That's a situation where I think an RCT may be relevant. And if we look at one report again, the whole issue of statins now, and I find this report particularly interesting. This is the cumulative incidence of in-hospital mortality during COVID-19 and statin users versus no statin users stratified by the presence or absence of diabetes. Fairly large samples shown here. And these are people without diabetes on statins versus those not on statins. And interestingly enough, those who are on statins who had diabetes appeared to have about a third uh, less likelihood of the incidence of in-hospital mortality than those who were not. Now, again, one study doesn't build a case. And I could have shown you one study with citagliptin that showed you a benefit of being on citagliptin versus not. But I think these kind of anecdotal reports really do make a case for saying we need to add a statin and people who are not on statins. But clearly, if you don't have diabetes, the observational data support no clear benefit of being on statins in terms of outcomes.
Now, I'm going to conclude by saying the American Diabetes Association stepped forward last year to put a million dollars to fund 10 grants of 100,000 each for one year to fund COVID-19 diabetes related research. And the meeting I was on earlier today at the NIH really related to the NIH perspective about where this field's at and what they can do to further the cause of understanding the science of COVID-19 infection in people with diabetes and ultimately how to improve outcomes. So here's a list of the, of the PIs on, on these grants that were funded, the name of the institution these individuals had sourced from, and the nature of these grants. And I, I'm not going to read each and every one, but some of these are very clinically based, a few are population based, and a few basic science based. But all of these, I think, were a, a plethora of backgrounds that relate to different types of science with a hypothesis testing that could ultimately be accomplished with a one-year interval with results to follow that we think should be informative going forward. So let's conclude uh, based on my presentation of COVID-19 and diabetes, uh, the evolving paradigm of observational data. Are patients with diabetes at increased risk for COVID-19? The evidence right now is insufficient to say yay or nay. They may be, but we just can't prove that by the population data we have. Are patients with diabetes with COVID-19 infection at increased risk for hospitalization, ICU admission, assisted ventilation, and all-cause mortality? And I'm going to just globally say between two and three times more likely for all of these outcomes that are less favorable. The third bullet point, impact of hyperglycemia and outcomes, evidence clearly from multiple studies and observational data put forth is that hyperglycemia needs to be corrected. And I don't think randomized controlled trials are needed here. I think we have enough data from the observational data put forth in the peer-reviewed literature we have that we don't need randomized controlled trials. The only exception might be patients with diabetes treated with steroids. Uh, ultimately, does, does that group need to be more carefully uh, considered in terms of glucose lowering? I would say yes. And that, that may be even a group we should even more so avoid a randomized control of the trial. But that's where we don't have enough data to really speak to outcomes. What about management considerations for patients with diabetes and COVID-19? Prevention and outpatient management, optimized glycemic management, and lifestyle in hopes to prevent hospitalization. And what about drug management and hospitalized patients with diabetes and COVID-19? Patients need to bring their meds and their pumps and CGM devices with them, hopefully to enhance self-management, which may be more likely in the non-unit admitted patients on the floor. Optimize glycemic management. Insulin's the base, best and really only convincing way to manage glucose management. And continue metformin if the patients are on it right now, unless there are contraindications, as I noted on the slide that relates to marked or severe renal insufficiency or patients who are dehydrated who need to be volume replete. Continue the RAS inhibitors, continue the statins at this point, although we certainly have very minimal data on the benefit, potential benefit of statin therapy in patients with diabetes. And I think consider corticosteroids, and we need to, when we consider corticosteroids, be certainly knowledgeable about the major impact it has on glycemia and the ability to adjust insulin by uh, IV administration uh, mostly to control glycemic exertion in that particular setting. So I'm going to stop there and uh, give you a picture of, of where I work and have worked in downtown Denver and the nice uh, panorama in the background to follow. So thank you so much for being on this talk today. I appreciate your attendance and uh, hope things uh, were hopefully informative enough to impact your knowledge in this, in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Eckel, for an excellent talk. Um, I will open this up for discussion. Um, so any questions, uh, you can uh, either ask, unmute, unmute your uh, computer, and you can ask, or you can type in a question uh, in the chat box. So either one um, is, is acceptable. Okay, so, a great overview. This is Satya Krishnasamy. Um, uh, that kind of helps me also confirm the findings we have in the local uh, city data. Uh, that uh, the group that you talked about, the surprise group of the uh, few patients who were previously undiagnosed and new onset hyperglycemia. Uh, 
where when we added that uh, cohort to this, the odds ratio almost doubled, which was quite impressive. Um, so um, would that also go along with the fact that, you know, when you look at nationally or, you know, undiagnosed diabetes of 30 to 40 percent that we mm -hmm. talk about, uh, is this something you see in every other outcomes like pneumonia or heart failure or, you know, MI or anything? Me and Dr. Mokshagandam were also talking about that, how powerful just adding that small group of perhaps we had like 40 patients among 250 diabetics, which was about 37% of the whole cohort was diabetes and type 2 uh, specifically. So. Uh, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, I think that's a very good question. If you think of our International Registry of Nuonset Diabetes, the fact that over half have an A1C less than 6.5 opens up the door to multiple explanations. Number one is these may be patients with type 1 di diabetes without knowledge who uh, really were glucose intolerant that had the acute illness be a precipitant to nuonset diabetes, although we know that uh, the patients with type 1 diabetes are often capable of demonstrating higher A1Cs much before diagnosis. So I think that's an unlikely explanation. But we've all seen people hospitalized for pneumonia or a myocardial infarction that, who are hyperglycemic at the time of hospitalization whose A1Cs may be normal, and ultimately they have persistent diabetes after discharge. So yes, and the question is mechanisms there. I think the stress of the illness in terms of counter-regulatory hormones and their modification of insulin sensitivity and strain on the beta cell, which is maybe already somewhat inadequate. And many of these people may have a diagnosis of prediabetes. So those patients are particularly at higher risk to develop stress-related hyperglycemia. And I think the other thing is probably the, the cytokine burden, the inflammatory response, which is true of most infections and may be present in, in many people without uh, just COVID-19, but influenza and any other bacterial infection or anything else. So I think there could be explanations for this group whose A1Cs are, are normal and they show up with hyperglycemia. I question whether this is going to be COVID-19 diabetes, so we're calling it, whether it's a specific defect where the virus has gained entrance into the beta cell and acutely damaged it to the point of maybe permanently modifying glucose tolerance to the extent that the diagnosis is made. And keep in mind, in the International Registry of the 300 plus patients we have, if the A1Cs are less than 6.5% in half, and that's the type of patient you're describing, then the diagnosis of diabetes may be not appropriately made during the hospitalization, right? These people probably need to have a glucose tolerance test in six weeks later after hospital discharge or have other ways to assess the presence or absence of diabetes. So. Uh, many unanswered questions, and I, I think, you know, the question you've asked is just really a, a very appropriate one. Thank you. So one of the things uh, from the previous, uh, you know, from the Vandenberg study about uh, intensive treatment and outcomes, the ones who did not have a diagnosis of diabetes and had high glucose and they were intensively treated, they had better outcomes than diabetics who were treated intensively. Is there any data to that? effect whether those without a prior diagnosis will do better if we treat them intensively here? You know, that's a good question. I, I In the databases that I presented, and that, those were quite a few studies, the, um, the data is in terms of them, what you wanted to address in the studies, really, I don't think I remember them dissected in that way. Uh, it would seem to me that a patient with more longstanding diabetes uh, it's going to do less well than someone who, in fact, is newly onset hyperglycemic. But the outcomes in, in the studies, which were kind of cross-sectionally evaluating glucose levels that are elevated, seem to show that the outcome in, in the initial observation for Bruce Bode, the outcome was worse in those patients than it was in patients with diabetes. So uh, I, I think, you know, there's not a good answer to that yet. I, I think we need to kind of continue the observational data expansion <laughs> to see if we can learn more about that. There were a couple of questions here on the chat box. Uh, one um, about whether the observational studies have had some impact on refining the standards of care. 
Well, we're presumably referring to the medical standards of care and diabetes by the Professional Practice Committee of the American Diabetes oh, Association. Mm -hmm. Yes, the updated standards of care do have a section on COVID-19 and diabetes, yes. So I encourage um, everyone to take a look at that. That's the January publication. Do you have any idea why the CDC did not include type 1? Is it because the numbers were small or, you know? I think it related to probably the lower prevalence of the disorder and also related to the fact that the numbers were smaller and I think importantly, because the data were not sufficiently broken down to the distinguish type one diabetes from type two diabetes. So th those three reasons, I believe. So the, the question of uh, glycemic variability, you know, um, because that is one of the biggest problem. I mean, that had a significant impact. And one of the common things that people do in the hospital setting is put them on the sliding scale, despite all the thing that which increases your variability a lot which also i think you know with the new diagnosis since they have not been previously diagnosed they wait for it hoping it'll get corrected and they keep you know uh, giving and not giving insulin and the blood sugar fluctuates a lot uh, is that one of the explanations that maybe you know Right. Well, I, have, I would hypothesize that with sliding scale insulin, boy, that's been a nemesis for decades now, hasn't it? Uh -huh. uh, and, and ultimately, I think most of our more sophisticated inpatient diabetes management teams have algorithms for how to modify glucose favorably in hospitalized patients without the sliding scale. But all that aside, I would imagine if your glucose is 320 and you get a large dose of bolus insulin, and then it's a 50 two hours later, that counter-regulatory hormones surge surge in, under those circumstances. And I think that's going to then create more <laughs> insulin resistance or perhaps a greater defect uh, in, in uh, all of insulin's actions in terms of antilipolysis, glucose production, and glucose assimilation by tissues to make that, that roller coaster, if you will, worsen. So I presume that there's a hormonal basis for, for some of those uh, impacts of glucose variability or time and range and outcomes, yes. There is also the thing that the, um, you know, some of these studies that were published earlier, you know, um, yes. they might not have had, because the, the treatment of COVID itself in terms of the management of the pneumonia, the, the, you know, ventilation, all of this changed over time. So are there any recent data that is different from the original ones? No, I don't think so. I think ultimately the more recent data are just a greater uh, length of observation. I haven't seen much different in tr difference in trends. I do think the one thing that's coming out though is uh, is the fact that, that improved glycemic control in, in the hospitalized patient is really a necessary step going forward. And that's why I would personally advise against any randomized controlled trials. We don't need them here. I, I do think that's what's been gathered over time more so than anything else. And I think the other thing, uh, Shri, is the fact that ultimately I think the data in type 1 have become sufficiently apparent now to make us realize that patients with type 1 do no better than type 2. And based on age, they may actually do worse. So, so this is the related question here uh, about any thoughts on why vaccine rollout schedules specify that individuals with type 2 get vaccines earlier than type 1. Well, that varies from state to state, and I think it depends on the criteria that uh, the, the states and their uh, departments of public health have put forth in terms of recommendations for who's high priority and who's a bit less and who's even lesser. The type one group has not entered in, mostly because of age. But as you well know, and you take care of at U of L, there's an increased number of type ones who are 70 years of age and older these days. <laughs> yeah. So they, they would probably be entered in based on age rather than diabetes. But I think that's the rationale for approaching the CDC and approaching the governors, all 50 of them, with a mandate that type ones, independent of age, should be considered. And that may actually open up their criteria for making type two more common, even if the age isn't above 65 or 70. One question that's here, Bob. Huh? Yes. So uh, vitamin D deficiency is one of the risk factors for poor outcomes in uh, COVID. Uh, are there any associations, particularly in diabetic patients, or any out, or any management guidelines? 
I'm glad you mentioned that vitamin D deficiency is a poor a predictor of poor outcomes. The cross section with patients with diabetes, I think it's still like the the, the steroid question. <laughs> you know, they have big groups with or without diabetes, and I, I think that there we just don't have the data to say people with diabetes are. By the way, are people with diabetes, do you think more likely to have vitamin D deficiency? And I think that's a debated literature. I think it may well be true. What's your thought about that? Well, I don't know. I think that uh, it's a very controversial subject, and there are a lot of it different is. opinions that I've seen on the literature. I can't claim to be that much of an expert, but what I've read, uh, I don't have that much of an insight to know whether there's any uh, advocate, whether there's any benefit of either pre-treatment and to optimize vitamin D in, in diabetic patients as a, uh, to prevent incipient disease, or whether right. one should be treated as soon as they get into the hospital. Well, I think it's one of those sets of observational data that vitamin D deficiency is a risk for poor outcomes with, with COVID-19 infection. Then I think ultimately we need to be using vitamin D as a metric on, on, uh, in, in outpatients at risk, perhaps. I think that should be more commonly implemented in an attempt to take a strategy for prevention up front. I mean, giving someone vitamin D who's vitamin D deficient in the hospitalized setting of severe COVID-19 infection is not going to do much good. For sure. But I think it, it begs the question, should we be surveying uh, a greater population at higher risk, pre presumably with people with diabetes, on vitamin D levels in an attempt to prevent worse outcomes if, in fact, COVID-19 does set in? Of course, the vaccination now promised by the president is going to be complete by the end of May. <laughs> uh, uh, that's, that's very hopeful, I think. But nevertheless, that's what's been recently stated. So. So I assume that even now there's too much of a, uh, a variance in the data from different studies. Now in the international data, um, the, are the BMI cutoffs for the role of obesity, are, are they all the same or they have used, because in uh, Asian populations and everything, have they used the same cutoff or used a different standard? Well, like, are you speaking about the... Mm -hmm. We're talking about the registry. You're talking about all the databases yeah. of the, the registry. Registry. No, no, there's no BMI limit. I mean, okay. someone could have a BMI of 45 and be included in that database if they have new onset diabetes. So, so is severe I, obesity I was, one of the highest risks? Well, we don't know. Again, the the 306 subjects that have been entered into the registry haven't been evaluated yet. So all I know is what uh, Francesco Rubina told me. This morning is that uh, ultimately uh, the 306 patients uh, over half have an A1C of less than 6.5 percent. That's all I can speak to right now. It looks like the uh, male gender and um, older males is seems to be the highest risk of all different cohorts, uh, Doctor. Uh, Echel, when I looked at the different studies, you know, whether it's obesity or diabetes, that, that seems to be a very powerful uh, kind of thing, other than, of course, the racial uh, differences, which we don't see in all the studies. Like here in Louisville, we didn't see big racial differences in outcomes, um, right. which was good in a way. But yeah, that, that varies from population to population. I think the overall data gathering process that was put forth and the recent systematic review indicated that race ultimately played pretty equally across the age groups, but that I think relates to the studies included in that analysis. So uh, age is critically the most important in, in concerning all of the risk factors for poor outcomes. But male gender a little bit more than female, diabetes and obesity probably are somewhat equal. And of course, most patients with type two are likely obese. I mean, most of them are, or at least overweight. So, so there's another question here. Uh, any relationship between higher triglycerides and mortality? No, and the cholesterol relationship hasn't been so clear either. So lipids don't seem at this point to make much difference, but it's kind of interesting that patients with diabetes on statins seem to have better outcomes. At least that one report showed that. So. So Dr. Eckel, one thing uh, we noticed in the cohort here, which I keep coming back to because I was just impressed with the Bodhi study and our 
a small group of the undiagnosed, which seem to have a very high impact on the outcomes, um, is that on you know, the presenting symptoms or initial evaluation in the ER for hospitalized patients, uh, confusion or acute mental status, independent of HHS or DK or anything, seem to be much uh, more common presentation among the diabetics uh, compared mm. to the non diabetics. I wonder if that's something um, you know, that has been noted, which I thought was very interesting because still many of them, even eight months later, talk about brain fog and just not able to get, get it together, the COVID syndrome that you talk about, the post-COVID. So I wonder right, if it affects them in a different way. Yeah, there's no question that uh, the neurologic um, impact of this disease has been increasingly recognized. The brain clearly can take up the virus and ultimately there can be a, a series of neurologic symptoms related to this. Uh, the COVID, um, long COVID syndrome, which occurs post-infection, often uh, is, is really uh, accompanied by fatigue. Um, a large majority of people are fatigued for some period of time and others have some neurologic symptoms, mostly not severe, but whether people with diabetes are more likely, I could envision they could be for a lot of reasons, microvascular disease and existing uh, neuropathy, et cetera. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I think your observation is worth, uh, worth uh, your experience for sure and paying attention to that. Thank you. Okay, so. All right, well. Thank you all. And uh, I just want to remind everyone that tomorrow morning, um, Dr. Echo will be presenting the uh, Tauri lecture um, at uh, 8 o'clock Eastern time. It's very early for him, 6 o'clock uh, mountain time. So thanks a lot for doing that so early in the morning. Uh, You're we'll welcome. Be very glad that he'll be talking about cardiovascular, cardiometabolic medicine, uh, time for a, a new subspecialty of internal medicine. So right. we look forward to the talk uh, tomorrow morning. All right. Well, thank you, Sri. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, I hope. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>